We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back, everybody. We've got a little bit of a, a different podcast today, but I think it shall be one of our most interesting. Um, if you're an observer of Congress or politics in general, you probably often think that uh, someone of the opposing political party or maybe even your own party is possessed, possessed by the devil. I mean, just based on their behavior and the things they say and the things they believe. Of course, they are not actually possessed and they do not actually need an exorcism. They're just deeply confused about the facts and um you know as, as as many people in politics are um beholden to their emotions to a, to a very large extent they need some kind of help um but it's not an exorcist but many believe that evil truly does exist in the world and actually manifests in the form of a demon which can indeed possess and take control of a human being right this is a, a key tenet of, of the catholic um the catholic religion and to deal with that, the Catholics um, train exorcists. And, well, there's, of course, a growing interest in exorcism, mostly from because of recent movies like The Pope's Exorcist. I'm not going to lie. That's what got me thinking about doing a podcast like this after I saw that movie and watched Russell Crowe uh, do, I think, an excellent Italian accent. Um <laughs> And uh, so today we have a really interesting guy. I can't can't wait to talk to him. Uh, we're joined by a, a real Catholic priest and a real exorcist, the pastor of St. Uh, Malachi or Malachi Parish. How do I pronounce that? Actually, uh, I've been reassigned. It's St. Michael's Parish. St. Oh, Michael's. So much, I, I can pronounce Michael. St. <laughs> Michael's Parish in Brown. Is that also in Brownsburg, Indiana or is it different? It's, it's still now, in it's Indiana. A, it's in Indiana, Brookville, Indiana. Got it. And um, you are the designated exorcist of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Indianapolis, one of the very few Vatican-trained exorcists in the U.S. And um, Father, thank you for talking to us today. Yes, Dan, it's good to be with you today. So, geez, where do we even begin? Um, I think I'd, I'd like to begin with uh, actually how you even become an exorcist in your own in, in, in your own history. Um, what is the training cycle here? Is it is it you know these classes that you go to? How how does the Catholic Church choose who who should should go through the training and who shouldn't? How do they choose how many we need in the, in in the first place? Maybe we start there with your own history. Yeah, I think a good place for people to understand is that the uh, the local Catholic bishop in his diocese is is the exorcist. He has this uh, office by virtue of his episcopal ordination. So Catholics believe that the bishops are the successors to the apostles. When Jesus sent the apostles out, he gave them authority over all unclean spirits. So the bishop is the exorcist in his diocese, and then a bishop at his discretion may appoint one or more of his priests to do this ministry in his name. So I was appointed back in 2005. At the time that I was appointed, I became one of only about 12 Catholic exorcists in the United States. And the church says the best way to learn how to be an exorcist is through the apprenticeship model. And since there were so few here in the United States, my bishop sent me to Rome for training. So in the early part of 2006, I lived in Rome for three months and I trained under a Franciscan priest. He allowed me to sit in on 40 exorcisms that he performed during that time. And that allowed me to learn firsthand the church's ministry to those who are up against the forces of evil and who are seeking the help of the church. So, well, I mean, in, in my reading on this, though, is there there, there are classes, right? There's there, there's a formal training that that occurs. I mean, you, are there are there steps that you take that would? Uh, is there a process, you know, again, steps or or something that you do during an exercise? Well, all we know about is the movies, you know, and there's, yep. there's certain rites that are recited. Um, uh, or is it is it a little is it looser than that? Is it more formal than that? How do you or, or, and, and how, how does the training now compare to say what, what you did in two thousand five? I think exorcism has become more prevalent uh, throughout the world. 
And because of that, it's more structured. When I was appointed 18 years ago, that structure was really not in place. For example, right now, there is an exorcism training school for Catholic priests in the United States that did not exist back in 2005. So the church has been trying to put more of a formal structure to the training of priests. It's easy to learn and to understand what the church believes and teaches about the reality of evil and the ministry itself, but it's another thing to have the practical application or the internship, if you will. And I think the church has uh, structured it a lot within these past 18 years. So we have the training school. There's now an international association of exorcists uh, based in Rome that gathers every other year. as an opportunity for priests in this ministry to do ongoing training and formation and to also create a sense of collegiality with one another. And there's also a Vatican uh, course on exorcism also in the city of Rome that uh, gives updates on the reality of evil and the ministry of exorcism itself. So it has become more structured uh, since I was first appointed. Like what, can you give us an example of some of the lessons that, that might go on like in a classroom session on, on qualifying as an exorcist, you know, to be a, a and, and 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 are you licensed in, in any sense? I mean, so like, I mean, so the Catholic Church has to, they don't just let anybody go do an exorcism, right? You have to have some kind of, however you would. You call have it. to have, you have to have the authority from your bishop. Yeah. So the bishop is the one who has that authority, who gives it to uh, his priest to you do use this. that authority, what based on whether you've been to the the training or not. So. I mean, give, give us some, some idea of like what that classroom training looks like. Um, is it? I, I wouldn't. I don't even know how to ask the question honestly because you know. I'd, Actually, maybe, they, maybe describe it. The training really looks at things from a spiritual, physical, and a mental health uh, scope. So exorcists are trained to be skeptics. I should actually be able, believe to be the last person to believe that someone is truly possessed every other possible explanation needs to be looked at. So in these classes, medical doctors come in and talk about medical conditions that could be very similar to someone who's possessed. For example, Mm -hmm. maybe somebody who has Tourette syndrome, you know, audible outbursts and things like that. The church would see that as a sign of possession, but it also could be a physical cause. So doctors will be in the room Psychiatrists and psychologists also come in and speak about mental health issues. So the church is looking at someone who believes that they're afflicted from the lens, both, you know, medical and also psychological and not just spiritual. Okay. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And then what are, what are, what is, once those options have been ruled out, right? Once those, those possibilities have been ruled out medically, what is step one for an exorcist according to the training? What do you, where do you and start? I would, do, I would do an intake questionnaire. So I would want to know if this truly is demonic affliction, then what was the entry point? What did the person do that created that connection with evil? Because for the most part, it's the ordinary aspects of our faith that will keep evil at bay. You know, if one is a Christian, for example, if you're going to church and you're praying, you're reading the Bible, the devil's already on the run. But did somebody do something that created an entry point? Mm -hmm. So that intake questionnaire would try to determine what that entry point might have been. Because by me knowing how the person created the entry point, then I know what I need to do through this particular prayer of the church to close that entry point. A next step in the... uh, but who are you asking? Are, are you asking like their loved ones or asking them directly? It's a or combination it? of both. Yeah. Asking family members, asking friends, people who know them well, okay. and even the person, him or herself. Right. Again, trying to understand what was that entry point. I would look for signs of uh, demonic possession that the church has identified. There are four of them. One would be the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual. So if I'm talking with someone and all of a sudden Greek is being spoken and I know from my history with this person, they don't speak that language, that would be an indication that there is the presence of some other entity. 
who's now using this person's body as if it were its own. There can be superhuman strength beyond the normal capacity of the individual. There can be elevated perception, meaning uh, I'm hearing things that I know that this person otherwise should not know. Mm -hmm. And then one that perhaps people are very familiar with would be a very negative reaction to anything of a sacred nature, such as being in a chapel or being in a church, having the Bible read in front of them, being blessed with holy water, being shown a crucifix. So all of these could be signs of a demonic presence. And, okay, so that's the analysis part. And mm -hmm. and then how do you actually, what's step one of actually conducting the exorcism? So Because at this point, okay, so you, you've ruled out medical conditions, you've ruled out mental health issues, um, you've identified an entry point, and uh, you've identified the signs. And so now it's time to get to work. What is the, what's, what's step one, two, and three? And first of all, it's, it's important to note too, that the person has to have the desire not to have the evil gone, but they mm -hmm. have to be willing to invite God into their life. If someone's the best, we could say that they're living in the realm of the devil, mm -hmm. but they have to not just want to get out of that realm. They have to want to grow in faith and holiness and virtue. And there's a lot of people today that contact me. And I will say, because I'm publicly known, I get about 3,500 requests a year for people who believe they're up against the devil and are seeking help from the church. Mm -hmm. And it's not just Catholics that turn to the church. There are people from other Christian faith traditions, other world religions, people with no faith background whatsoever. But there it does have to be that desire to have some type of a relationship with God in their life. Because and, so and, and how do you assess that? I mean, it, I guess... But them simply saying it, I guess, would, would would be enough. I mean, what if again? All, all, most of us, all we can go off of is what we see in the movies, and in mm -hmm. the movies, they sort of kind of uh, they they sort of transition between almost like multiple personalities. Yeah. The, the real person comes out and screams, "Help me!" And then the you know then the devil takes them back again. Um, and it's usually somebody's pretty innocent. So you know, at least in Hollywood exorcisms, at least it's 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 rarely you rarely see this sort of entry point. Uh, it, it's, um, uh, and, and so I may, would you say then that's kind of unrealistic, uh, from, from the Hollywood perspective that it's, it's always some child that's like, it is some innocent <laughs> child that's being possessed. Is that, that's, that's not something you, you would often see? No, absolutely not. It would be, you know, some entry points, um, it might be worthwhile mentioning some of them that I have seen over the years ties to the occult. So people mm -hmm. are engaging in activities that are contrary to faith. Maybe yeah. somebody has been cursed. Maybe someone has uh, dedicated. How does, someone, how does someone get cursed? How do, like, how does that even like by, by witchcraft or I mean, something, yeah. something outside, yeah. there's, there's no cursing in Christianity as, as far as I understand it, but, but it's out. You mean the occult, right? Somebody's doing a curse and therefore opening themselves up to yeah. evil. And, it's like and, a blessing. Think of a blessing, the power behind a blessing would be the power of God, and the mm -hmm. power behind a curse would be the power of the devil. So when yeah. somebody is invoking a curse on someone, they're turning to the devil. I will say mm -hmm. that curses are only effective if we're weak in our faith, because we yeah. can't control yeah. what another person does. They could wish us ill, wi Ill will, but mm -hmm. if we're strong in our faith, St. Paul talked about putting on the armor of Christ, if we're strong in our faith, and even if someone's trying to curse us, it will have no impact on us whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Other types of entry points would be uh, someone dedicating themselves to a demon, uh, perhaps somebody that has suffered some type of abuse, and in the midst of that brokenness, they turn to the world of the demonic, believing that somehow that's going to put the pieces of their life back together. And what are they doing? Are they like? Are they literally Googling demons and 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 figuring out like ah this one seems like a good one and then they, like, they start like pray. i mean really like about how, how else do you do it is there praying to them just i don't know these are lost people right these are these are people as as you're describing you know uh a, a low point in their lives let's say um you know i guess we, we all know the type i, I suppose mm -hmm. and is that what they do i mean they l literally choose one and and I think I think we're living in an age when we see that Christianity is in decline. You know, even yeah. though Christianity built built Western civilization, there's a lot of people that 
somehow believe that Christianity no longer speaks to them. And in the midst of this, I, th I think we're seeing a trend where people are turning to ancient faith traditions uh, that perhaps existed before Christianity. They could be, you know, engaging with some type of, you know, evil entity, if you will. So sometimes when people are looking in the midst of their woundedness or brokenness for help, they may not realize that where they're turning to may actually make their situation even worse than before. Because even you think of in the world of the occult, people may turn to like psychics and mediums who can mm -hmm. claim to help other lives back together. At least from a Catholic perspective, the power behind all of that would be the power of evil. And initially it may be seen as something good. People may experience some type of a benefit simply as a way to lure them deeper into that world, but then eventually the bottom falls out and the person finds itself in a situation that was worse than it was before. What do you, what do you think of people who, who claim they can hear the dead? They're not trying to necessarily. They're not even looking for it. I, I've, I've met some people like that and I don't know whether I believe them or not, but the, but it, they're certainly not looking for it. They're not worshiping anything. They're just like, I remember them uh, we, with this one girl we knew. She came into our house and she's just like, I don't really want to spend the night here anymore. Uh, this is an older house we used to live in because uh, I, I, I hear voices. They don't seem bad, but I hear them at night. You know, like, well, how, how does how does the Catholic Church explain that? Is it doesn't she wasn't opening herself up to anything, really, it seemed. Um, it was just a, it's just a very matter of fact. Yeah, I think it, the question might be where is the source of the information coming from? Because even in the Catholic tradition, there are people that are called mystics. Somehow they can operate on a different spiritual wavelength, if you will. Yeah. But it's not a thing that they're doing. Somehow it's a gift or a charism that God has bestowed upon them. Mm. And perhaps a good way of understanding it would be, is the person a man of God or a woman of God? So it's really not what they're doing or any power that they're claiming for themselves, they recognize that it is a gift or a charism that God has given to them. Yeah. You know, a good, a good analogy would be in the Old Testament, if people are familiar with the story, when Moses goes before Pharaoh and says, let my people go, the staff in Moses' hand turns into a serpent. But then mm -hmm. Pharaoh's magicians are able to do the exact same thing. So what mm -hmm. separates the magicians from Moses? Well, and the answer would be Moses is a man of God. And what he's doing is through the power of God, but the magicians would be relying on the power of evil. So people who claim to have a, a gift or a charism being able to you know, hear the dead and that type of thing. Again, I think it would be a question of that ability. Is it being directed back to God, who's the one who's permitting it to happen? Or would it be attributed to some type of evil? Hmm. Interesting. Either way, it was unsettling because it was my house. Um, <laughs> and, um, okay, so so step, but let's go back to the the mechanics, and then I, I definitely want to have more of a conversation about the nature of evil and, and the decline of Christianity and kind of this restlessness. I think that that the humanity faces mm -hmm. always seeking out some other option. Um, you know, we'll get into a deeper conversation about that. Uh, and, and of course, uh, some examples of, of exorcisms and, and what constitutes a minor exorcism and a major exorcism, you know, like what's, uh, there's so many questions here. Um, but, but, but again, back, back to step one, I'm, um, you, you've, they, they want to be exercised of, of, of this evil. And so what is step one, um, is is there a very formal process that you know reading certain rites or, or prayers or mm -hmm. what is it yeah so exorcism will be a liturgical rite for catholics so there is a prescribed way for it to be done so once i determine that an exorcism will uh, will be performed i prepare myself as a catholic priest i would celebrate mass i go to confession i determine where the exorcism will take place it's always in a sacred space I jokingly tell people it never occurs in an abandoned house at midnight, you know, on a dead end street during a thunderstorm. That might make for a great movie, but ultimately <laughs> the devil doesn't get to determine where he will be seated. 
the church herself will make that determination. Okay. So you have to transport, the you transport the person. They're not, they're not chained to a bed. Nope. No one is ever, <laughs> uh, you know, no one is ever restrained yeah. because again, a sign of demonic possession would be superhuman strength. Mm -hmm. So I would rely on the power of God rather than power of any type of restraint. But have, have you ever come across someone who was already restrained? I mean, th that because that's always how it's presented in the movies, right? They're they've become so dangerous, mostly to themselves. Oftentimes, they're trying to like break that own body down, um, and so they're restrained and like e even moving them, transporting them seems like imp impossible uh, in the movies. So, mm -hmm. but that that's not something you come across. That's not a situation yeah. you come across. Yeah. You can usually transport them. Yep, yeah. and usually they they will come to the. Uh arranged uh, location or the church where the exorcism will take place. They'll come with a family member or friend. Right. And I would determine who else is going to be present. There is so no they're, usually, they're usually like with it. I mean, it, it, again, it, it, going back to the movies, like they're, they're like fully possessed in the movie where it's not even them, you know, they're like, they're completely uh, uncooperative. So, but in reality, you're saying it's, it's, it's a bit more nuanced than that. That it's, it's, it's like, they're both in there. Absolutely. Just because someone's possessed doesn't mean they're manifesting all the time. To be possessed mm -hmm. means that somehow this person has entered into the realm of the devil. You know, mm -hmm. someone possessed couldn't be going through the normal circumstances of daily life, you know, going to work or school and whatnot. But then something would trigger that connection with the demonic, which would cause the manifestations. And that's a good point to point out, because sometimes people will say, if someone's Best, how can they ask for help? But again, remember, they're not manifesting all the time. I see. So then I would also determine who else is going to be present. There may be some other priest or people who are present to pray. An exorcism is never done one-on-one. -on -one. That's not a prudent thing to do in, in today's world. And again, the person has to specifically request that they want help from the church. You know, the, an exorcism is not performed on anyone against their free will. They have to request it. We all have free will. We can make the choice for good. We can make the choice for evil. Someone wanting help for someone else is not enough. Person has to want help for themselves. And then once all these things are have taken place, the rite itself begins by blessing the person with holy water. It reminds us of our baptism in Christ, by which we have become a new creation. And it is important to note that all the aspects of the rite are meant to force the demon to manifest. Because the battle against it can only begin once it shows itself. A demon would prefer to remain hidden, if you will. But when it's dragged out into the light, so to speak, then the battle against it begins. So the blessing with holy water, there's a litany of the saints calling upon the saints to be present in this particular prayer of the church. There's reading of Psalms out of the Old Testament, gospel accounts of Jesus performing exorcisms, basically as a way of saying to the demons, Christ has defeated you already. Why resist the power and the authority of Christ that he has given to the church? There is also then the laying on the hands of the head of the person, invoking the Holy Spirit, even breathing on the face of the person, calling upon the Holy Spirit. It's the recognition that wherever the Holy Spirit is present, an unclean spirit cannot remain. Then there is kind of a minor exorcism prayer, which is a prayer directed to God, is asked to bring relief into the life of the person who is suffering. And then there is a major exorcism command given to the demon itself, commanding it to depart in the name and by the authority of Jesus Christ. So it's very, very structured. It's a liturgical rite. I go through the rite completely once. And as I'm praying the rite, I can watch and observe the, how the person is reacting, how the demon is reacting. And then I can go back and repeat the parts of the rite that seem to have the most impact on this particular demon. Mm. And an exorcism can, you know, it can last uh, for hours. It can, you know, I can work with someone over the course of the year. So each person and their situation is different and distinct. So there really is no standard on when the demon will be cast out. And even with that said, Every time that I would pray with someone, they do receive some spiritual benefit, even if they don't uh, receive complete deliverance at that particular session of exorcism. Yeah. What 
what is the um if any conflicts within different denominations of christianity on on the uh I suppose the, the the credibility of exorcism or the reality of exorcism. Uh, the Catholic Church seems to be the only one that has a very formalized, uh, you know, exorcist doctrine. Uh, is, is am I right in saying that? I mean, how how do other denominations view this this practice of exorcism? I think exorcism is uh, it's present within other Christian faith traditions. It's also present within uh, other world religions. Mm -hmm. Again, for Catholics being a liturgical rite, there's a structured way for it to be done. I always say that, you know, the Catholic Church doesn't have a monopoly on the practice of exorcism, because ultimately we would believe that in an exorcism, Jesus is not a bystander. He is the main actor. If people are relying on me, we're all in trouble. But if they're relying on the power of Christ, that's the proper mindset to have. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, I grew up Methodist. Maybe this makes me a bad Methodist, but like the, the, the Methodists disagree with with exorcism. Do the Baptists disagree with uh, exorcism doctrine that Catholics practice? I, I just I don't know if there's any actual conflict there. I don't think so. I think there's that general recognition that evil is yeah. a reality. You know, evil is not just humanity's inhumane treatment of one another. It can also be personified in what we call right. the devil. So so it's we, I think we, there's that general acceptance in the reality of evil and the devil, but perhaps the way to combat it might be approached differently. But again, well, for Catholics, we would have a very formal right on how it's done. Right, right. And that's kind of the essence of Catholicism, right? <laughs> and I, when I go to Mass, uh, and I do go to Mass, because like I said, I was uh, I married into the, the, the Catholic faith. So I, I've been told that my daughter will be raised Catholic. And so that's, that's just that's where I'm at. Um and uh, yeah, it's 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 quite different from from uh, you know my my upbringing. Um, like because I think in other faith traditions, it may just be more impromptu. It is if somebody's talking with their local pastor and there's a demonic manifestation, the pastor right then and there may simply begin praying over that person. Right. Well, so he's you know again watching the Pope's exorcism and getting the idea to do this podcast. I thought there was some really interesting lines in there as. As um, this seems a bit unrealistic that the uh, you know he he was pulled before the um, some kind of council, some kind of higher council in the Vatican, and they were yelling at him about something about maybe performing an exorcism. It seemed a little unrealistic since this is part of Catholic doctrine. I didn't think he'd be getting yelled at for it, but there was, but he was being questioned on you know the the need for for exorcisms. Um, and he, and he asked sort of a rhetorical question, you know, if there's if there's if there's no evil in the world and what, what why is there a need for a church? Right. Mm -hmm. And and so it's it's a, it's an implicit understanding that uh, there is evil in the world. And I think all, all forms of Christianity agree with that, Um, you know, where there's where there's skepticism in the general public, then would be, you know, how it actually manifests. And I think that's why this is such an interesting uh, conversation. Um, What is the what is the. For 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 people who 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 don't know, and you mentioned um, how the, the, in, in the gospel Jesus performs exorcisms. That's where we're deriving this this authority from, right? From the gospel. Which are, are there certain are there certain sections that are the most important for people to 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 reference um, in the gospel uh, that 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 show that there's there's there is an authority behind exorcism that there is a, a credibility to it. I think in Mark's gospel there are some great accounts of Jesus performing exorcisms. And it's important to note that Jesus even makes the distinction between uh, casting out demons and healing the sick. Because a lot of times people that don't believe in exorcism or, the, or that evil is personified in what we call the devil would say that Jesus was uh, just playing up to the belief of the day, that Jesus knew these people weren't possessed, but because that was their mindset, he was just kind of going along with it. But I think that's kind of reading a lot into sacred scripture, because, again, Jesus makes the clear distinction between when he sends his disciples out with the authority to cast out demons and then the power to heal. So Jesus is making the distinction between physical illness and somebody who has been attacked spiritually by a demon. Then the church continues to make that distinction today. OK, so let's get let's get to some interesting parts here, though. I think the audience is really waiting for what, what's your 
you started in 2005 on this journey. What what was your first? And you said your your initial apprenticeship in in the Vatican within the span of three months. Um, you were you were part of 40, 40 uh, exorcisms. If I yes. if I heard you right back then, so that's a lot. Um, and is that all within Europe? Is that within Italy? Is that within a local area? That was all within the city of Rome with one exorcist. Wow. So, and in, 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 in Italy, throughout Italy, here's a good example. There are 300 Catholic exorcists in Italy alone. Huh. Are, are there just, it's just just a greater need for it in Italy? What's going on in Italy? <laughs> I think there's a distinction between parts of the world that will readily accept the possibility mm. that what one is suffering from is not just a mental health issue, but it could be spiritual. Yeah, because I've had the opportunity in the years I've done this ministry to travel to different parts of the world. I think in the Western world, we might be quick to believe that it's just a mental health issue and the person needs counseling or medication. Right. But I think, well, again, in other parts of the world, they are open to the possibility that it's spiritually related. And that makes sense. What was your first what was your first moment um, that really affected you? I would say the very first exorcism that I set in on. So the exorcisms uh, took place at a, a St. Lawrence outside the walls of Rome. Mm -hmm. So I would walk down to the Fountain of Abbey about three days a week and then catch a bus, take a 15 minute ride out to St. Lawrence Church, which was on the outskirts of Rome. Um, big church, there was a courtyard. When I first arrived, I went into the church and when I came out, there were about 50 people in the courtyard. Uh, some of them were actually manifesting already. And these people were all waiting to see the priest who was training me. Some had appointments and some did not. I went to the office where this priest was and went in and greeted him and met him. And then he brought me into a room where uh, there was an elderly woman with her husband. And the priest told me that the woman was possessed. And so I sat down and began to talk with her. And the priest was in another room getting ready. And I'm talking to her, her and her husband, and I'm thinking, well, this doesn't seem so bad. You know, she seems quite normal, if you will. And then the priest training me, he walked into the room and he put a roll of paper towels on the table. He walked back out again and he came in again and tied a plastic grocery bag onto the wall radiator. He walked out again and I'm looking at him and talking to this lady and her husband. Then he comes back in again and he was a Franciscan priest, so he's wearing brown robes. He comes back in again, and he has a purple stole, which is a uh, cloth that a priest wears around his neck, which is a sign of the priestly office. He has the rite of exorcism in one hand, has holy water in the other. He takes the holy water, and he blesses this woman. And as soon as the drops of water hit her head, she began to growl and snarl. She began to foam at the mouth. Her eyes rolled in the back of her head. Briefly, they refocus with this terrible, ugly, horrendous, evil look on her face and then began spouting out blasphemies and cuss words. And I'm kind of looking at this thinking, what in the world have I gotten myself into? And then the priest very calmly, he just reaches over and tears off a paper towel, wipes the foam off of this lady's mouth, throws it in the grocery bag and then continues with the prayer of the church. Wow, <laughs> it's right off the bat. And are they are they all like that? I mean, I, you know, so out of out of those first forty, I mean, are they all similar in scope, or you know, how many of those do you do, do you just start to assess that ah, there, there's probably a, a physical issue here, there's a mental health issue? You know, what's the per, what's the percentage there? Or are we you talking know, I, 40, 40, 40 exorcisms that have been defined? Uh, they've already ruled out those things. I, I would say that uh, these were uh, true exorcisms that this priest was performing, all different types of manifestations. You know, I, I've witnessed some crazy, what most people would think would be crazy things over the years. You know, I witnessed when I was in Rome, for example, in one of the exorcisms, when the demon manifested, the person's body began to levitate. And, and there's you, you no see other that. way to, there's no there's other no way other to way explain to describe that. that. You look at that and you think, that body is no longer physically attached to that chair. And I'm kind of looking at this in disbelief. And the priest simply reaches over with his hand and he puts it on the head of the person and pushes them back down into the chair. You know, all of these things that the, the demonic does is meant to instill fear. 
the theatrics, if you will, are meant to say, look at me and my power and what I'm capable of doing, because it's meant to detract and deflect away from the power of God. An exorcism that I did uh, here in the States, and again, this is an example of how things are different in each case, when the demon manifested, uh, the person's eyes turned green in front of me, and their pupils became slanted like a serpent. And this voice came out of the, the person's mouth in reference to Jesus saying, well, who's he? He has no power over us. That's so there can be all kinds <laughs> of strange things that can be seen. And I think I think that's where where, where people's skepticism comes in because I mean now we're talking about things that we don't even you know I, I, well, let, let's 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 deliver the question that like most I think skeptics would ask and especially those who probably aren't religious is well why doesn't why doesn't why doesn't the power of God make somebody levitate why why can't we have somebody good uh, do something amazing and and uh, like like levitate in modern times right where we can film it and you know obviously. You know, we have saints who are, are defined as, as such by 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 um, uh, committing miracles and you know maybe extraordinary superpowers are, are are part of that. But you never see anything like it in modern times, and yet this this random demon can make somebody levitate. Um, and there's no other way to explain it. I mean, how high? I have I have like really specific questions about that one. I mean, how <laughs> like six inches, a foot, two feet? I mean, and there's no way they were kind of. Like we, you know, in the in the in the in the heat of battle, there that you didn't see them kind of stand on their tiptoes or or push themselves up. I mean, they were there was this. And we know about a, the person's body was about a foot out of the chair, and the demon had this hideous grin on its face, basically kind of this sense of pride, saying, "What? Well, look at me, and look at what I can do." Do you ever know the demon's name? Again, this comes from Hollywood. It, they, they always they always have to figure out the demon's name first. That's like the first entry point into getting rid of them. Is that a thing or no? It was a part of the old rite of, of Catholic exorcism. The belief yeah. being that if you know a person's name, you have a certain power and control over them. So when a demon names itself, it's actually showing that it's submitting to the authority and the power of God. Fascinating. What's the... Are there any other theories within the church on on what's happening in that moment? I mean, because it's it's there's no physical explanation for how an eye can turn that way, right? And then and then be perhaps examined later, and it's oh, it's perfectly normal eye. Um, you know, molecular changes are uh, we would say impossible. So, is there is there any theorizing in the church on on how on what might be actually happening there? Whether it's actually a physical change or whether it's it's this form of evil um, creating the perception to you. Yeah. Is that is that a possibility? Absolutely, because the demonic can play on a person's memory and imagination. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that you know the things that we see, the demonic is causing us to see these things, right? And as a way to try to manipulate reality, if you will, just based on their angelic nature even though it's a fallen angelic nature you know you know demons still have an angelic quality about themselves even though it's now distorted right and there's no filming there's no filming of these things is there is there any films of exorcisms i i, I was i said my staff on this and i think they said there was like one online but we, we don't know you know the church doesn't permit it i know father amorth the source yeah. of that movie we talked about you know the pope's exorcist yeah. Supposedly, someone claimed that he permitted one to be filmed, but I think the quality is very poor. It looks like it was done with a cell phone, but there's no way to know whether or not Father Amorth actually permitted that since he passed away back in 2016. Some people will say, well, if the church would just record these, then we would believe. But the reality is, even if the church recorded them, there would be people who would say, well, they've been distorted, they've been manipulated. So it's really a question of faith. You know, if you have faith, then believing is seeing. If you don't have faith, then you live by the mentality seeing is believing. So when you're when you're called in, um, you know, I, I guess your first appointment with a potential possession, you know, just percentage wise, what's how often do you say that this isn't a possession? This is uh, this is some other abnormality. You know, there are four different types of extraordinary demonic activity. 
So demonic possession, whereby a demon would take control of a person's body, treating that body as if it were its own, using the, using the person's mouth to speak, their eyes to see, their ears to hear. When someone's possessed, it's always important to make the clear distinction between the demon and that person as an individual. For example, when a demon begins to manifest in a person's body, I wouldn't say that John Doe did this or said that. The reference would always be to the demon. The other three types of extraordinary demonic activity would be demonic infestation, presence of evil in a location or associated with an object. Think of a voodoo doll, for example. There could be demonic vexation, whereby someone is receiving physical attacks from a demon. And then there can be demonic obsession, which are mental attacks. Literally, the demon is trying to get inside of the person's head, whereby everything that they're thinking is being filtered through this presence of the demon. And I will say that in the years that I've done this ministry, the majority of the people that I deal with are dealing with infestation, vexation, and obsession. Cases of demonic possession are real. They do happen. But perhaps only one out of every 5,000 people that I would see. And again, I would say that when it comes to infestation, vexation, and obsession, I've done thousands of these exercises and prayers over the years. Uh, but I, I do want to understand if I if I'm if I'm getting if I'm in layman's terms try to understand these I guess more minor forms of uh, not possession. So possession is one thing. There's vexations, obsessions, and and uh, infestations. Uh, in, in layman's terms, what what it would exactly, how how would we describe the, these 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 three things? It kind of because it kind of sounds to me as if um, it's like okay, you you've you're a teenager and you're using a Ouija board too much, right? That's against the Catholic Church beliefs. You should not use a Ouija board. Uh, my wife made very sure to tell me that <laughs> no Ouija boards in the house. Um, you know, because it's like a, and, and I, I assume the Catholic Church had to take like a, a an extreme stance on, not an extreme, but a, but a, but a very public stance on that because they're so prevalent. Because you can go buy one at a, at a toy store, and it's you know kids think it's fun. Um, but as you've said before, this is a sort of these things, while seemingly innocent, can become entryways, um, for evil, and, and so is it is it really as minor as that? Sometimes, um, is it bad behavior? really that's that's uh, that's kind of warranting that intervention is so sort of mm -hmm. just what, what what in reality is we're calling it an exorcism but in reality it's just it's 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 a priest having a spiritual intervention you know it's it's prayers it's yeah. just it's just it's just hey let's just come a little closer to god you know i think uh in, in layman's terms is that what we're talking about yeah and that's the best way to look at an exorcism is that it's a particular prayer so exorcism is a prayer it's meant to bring relief and healing into the life of someone who is suffering. Mm -hmm. So like demonic infestation, you know, somebody can invite evil in either directly or indirectly, directly when they know they're doing something that is contrary to the faith, but they choose to do it anyway. Basically the mentality, I don't care what God wants, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And then indirectly when they're doing something, perhaps they believe is fun and entertaining, but they don't fully grasp what they may be getting themselves into. So you've referenced like a Ouija board, for example. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't believe that if somebody used a Ouija board once, that somehow they're going to, you know, be possessed or create a, a connection with the demonic. But I think something like a Ouija board could be like an, an entry level. People get pulled yeah. into that world of magic and witchcraft and the occult. And then it, they have that slippery slope where they start to get involved in other things. And then, Ultimately, they find themselves really far away from God. Yeah. What um. What are some of the what's your scare? I mean, I think you maybe mentioned a couple of them, but what's your your most frightening moment um, with someone during an exorcism? Or was it was it these times when they their eyes turn green and <laughs> they levitate? That seems pretty frightening. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would, uh, I, I bet that image sticks in your mind. Are there any others that you want to share? Oh, absolutely. You know, I would say early on that maybe fear was more prevalent, but after 18 years of doing the ministry, all of these theatrics and things that the devil is doing don't really phase me in the least because I know that the power of God is greater than the power of evil. 
you know, over the years I've seen, uh, so I mentioned levitation, eyes turning green. I had a person, uh, when the demon manifested, bit the, um, the person's lip and started bleeding and then took the hand in the blood and then drew a pentagram on the wall in the room. I've had demons, when they manifest, they'll grab the crucifix out of my hand and, and throw it and smash it against the wall. There's been uh, times when the demon manifests and the person will drop to the ground and slither like a snake across the floor. There can be uh, the temperature in the room can drop and become much colder. There's these strong um, authoritative voices coming out because the demon wants to try to convince me that it's in charge and not me or the power of God that is present in this ritual of the church. Eyes rolled in the back of the head, uh, bodily contortions, uh, you name it, all of these have, I've seen over the years. Have the bodily contortions, because, because again, being the, the skeptic would say, okay, what if that's just somebody who has seen the movies and I guess is, is, it, is it, there's, there's obviously something mm -hmm. going on with them and it's a, it's a cry for attention in some ways. And so they've seen the movies and they, they speak that way. They, they act that way. It's what's, 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 what's really uh, convincing, I think is the, is the things that they can possibly do. Um, yeah. You know, in the movies, the bodily contortions often end up in broken bones and like really serious things that like a, a, even a per, even a mentally ill person can do to themselves. Have you ever seen something like that? I would say that that's why the church acts in a very methodical way. There is no such thing as an emergency exorcism. Usually yeah. by the time somebody reaches me, they're, they're telling me they're possessed and they need an exorcism. But I have to come to that conclusion on my own. Mm. And it rules out that sense of deception. Maybe somebody you know, due to a mental illness is trying to replicate the signs of being possessed. There may right. be some to make a, a mockery of the church. Mm. Again, that's why the church moves in a very methodical way. And I would want to come to know something about person and even require goes back. The person needs to have a, a physical examination by their family doctor. They need to have some type of a, psychiatric evaluation right. and again so you, uh, go, you go through those every time yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. sometimes people will say well you're requiring a psychiatric evaluation which means you don't believe me but the reality is if somebody is dealing with demonic they need to be in a good place mentally so even if it is demonic having the evaluation may help to take you know the edge off the person is no longer in a crisis mm -hmm. mentality you know, somebody calls me in the middle of the night and they say they're possessed, the first thing I would tell them to do would be to go to the local emergency room at the local hospital. Mm -hmm. Because again, they, that sense of manic needs to be brought down so that yeah. I could have a conversation with the person and then to weigh in and give my own opinion on what I believe that the person is actually uh, experiencing. So when in... In your region, in the Indianapolis region, I mean, what's your relationship like with local uh, healthcare providers? I mean, how did I assume you have one, right? Because so this because maybe they'll come, people come to you and you you refer them to certain doctors. And is there any is there is there ever conflict there? The doctors say, look, like let us treat them. You sh they shouldn't go to you. Is there is does that conflict ever happen? I mean, there always is that, especially within the mental health field. Because yeah. I think a lot of people within that field may reject the possibility that a person may be dealing with a demonic, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm okay with people seeing these people because, again, I don't want just people who agree with me. You know, most people think that because I'm the exorcist that I'm going to believe that it's demonic. But again, as I said earlier, the church would cause greater harm if it labels a person as being possessed. And that label prevents the person from getting the true help that they need. Normally, I would tell a person to go and see their own family doctor because that doctor already has a history of this person's medical background. And then if they don't have a mental health professional, then there are psychiatrists that I know that I could refer them to. But again, I'm not asking the psychiatrist or the doctor, do you think this person is possessed? I'll make that determination myself. I just want the best possible information I can get. 
And basically what I'm asking these experts is, is there something about this person's condition that is outside of your scope of training or understanding? Mm -hmm. How often do you see the, the different languages being spoken? Uh, I would say that in the people that I've dealt with, that's not been a commonality. Mm -hmm. So even though the church says that's one of the four possible signs of possession, that's not one that I've seen a lot. Usually the one that's more prevalent is the negative reaction to anything of a sacred nature. Mm -hmm. Because we can say that the parts of the rite of exorcism, the church is taking the aspects of our faith that the demons have rejected and literally throwing them into their faces. Yeah. You, know, you think again, like holy water, there's no power in it in holy water per se, it's what it represents. Namely, it reminds us of our baptism into Christ, as St. Paul in the letter to the Romans, are you unaware that we who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So it's that recognition that through baptism, we have been connected to Christ. And if we're truly living out that connection, then a demon cannot attach itself to us. It doesn't have the right to do that. So well, it always you, points to something greater. Even when you think of a cross or a crucifix, right? You know, why is a crucifix used? Because from a Christian perspective, the moment that Jesus is being crucified, the devil believes that he is one. But the moment of his perceived victory is actually the moment of his defeat. Because then the devil realizes that everything that he was doing that was leading Jesus to the crucifixion was actually playing into God's plan. So when the priest holds up the crucifix, he's basically saying, you have been defeated before, you will be defeated again. Do not resist in the power and the authority of Christ. You said um, not often do you see the, the different languages, but does that, does that mean you've seen it once, twice? Have you ever seen it? Oh, yeah. I've seen it multiple times. And I will say, because I'm publicly known, I probably deal with more cases than perhaps yeah. the the average exorcist. Some prefer to remain anonymous. Yeah. Uh, but when my bishop appointed me, he gave me permission to be public as a way to help educate people about what the church actually believes and teaches, because there is a lot of misinformation out there, whether it's on the internet, whether it's how it's portrayed in the movies. So it's an opportunity for the church herself to educate people about what it is that we actually believe about the reality of evil and the devil. And so, and, and, and in these cases where they, 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 they speak in a different language, there's just no way they could possibly know the language. And it's, yeah. it's just like, like what languages, what, what would they usually speak? Greek and Latin, like these older. Yep. Greek and Latin. And even though I may not be as fluent in those languages, when you hear them, you can recognize what the language is. Yeah. And you can so kind sometimes. of recognize if somebody's being fluent in it or not, too. Yeah. I had a case one time when a demon began to chant, and it was no recognizable language to me. And, you know, this person was possessed by two different demons. And so mm -hmm. when I commanded the demon to tell me what it was saying, the demon told me that it was glorifying the higher demon that was possessing this person as a way to show honor and glory to this higher ranking demon. And it was kind of doing so in its own language, if you will. So uh, that opens up like a whole bunch of new questions. <laughs> like, so like, what is demon world like? I mean, <laughs> I mean, is there, I, I've, I've never read anything from the church that sort of describes like, what is a demon hierarchy? How do they behave? Like, what are they, you know what I mean? Like, as a, so as a seal, right? Like we, we analyze the enemy's uh, structure and organizational structure, their, their, their habits, et cetera. Like how the true must be same of, of, of good and evil, right? The, mm -hmm. the church and the, and uh, the anti-church, whatever you call it. What, what do we, how do we describe, what do we know about demonic organizations and, and their hierarchies and, and who they are, how many there are, what their names are, et cetera. Yeah, I think some of the names of the demons are mentioned in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, a good question might be, where do the demons come from? From a Catholic perspective, we would say it's referenced in the book of Revelation, where it talks about how uh, Lucifer's tail swept one third of the stars out of the sky. So mm -hmm. when Lucifer chose to rebel against God, his choice to go against God reverberated through all the choirs of angels. 
And again, Catholics would say there are nine choirs of angels. So when these angels fell, they fell from all nine ranks. So just as much as there is a hierarchy in the angelic world, there is a hierarchy in the demonic world. And certainly at the top of that hierarchy would be Satan himself. And then there are higher and lower ranking demons. You know, some of the names mentioned in the Bible, we would see, you know, uh, names like Asmodeus, Beelzebul, for example, Abaddon, mm-hmm. a Leviathan. So there are examples of some of them uh, mentioned throughout Scripture. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, speaking of, of, you know, we talk about good and evil and how evil manifests. Uh, let, let's take another kind of pop culture reference. Uh, the, the recent Netflix series, uh, Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, you look at the history of this person. I mean, you kind of, I'm not an expert on his history. Let's, let's And I haven't seen the whole thing, but you know, he sort of, it, it talks, it, it, it shows how he develops into this monster that, that he becomes, how do Catholics view somebody like that? Let's not use him as a, an exact example, mm-hmm. but just somebody like that, who's doing things that are, that are just so beyond the scope of good. I mean, just so mm-hmm. beyond evil. Um, are they, are they possessed? Are they, are they just so mentally ill? Do we have an explanation without being able to actually speak to the person? Can you just not assess it? I mean, there's just there's there's people who do such terrible things in this world. Um, again, that just go beyond like criminality. That, that, that go beyond just you know falling away from God for a moment. Mm-hmm. Even if even if that's just joining gangs. I mean, there's 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 some things that are just so unspeakably evil yeah. that they they just they just they defy our understanding. How does how do, how do you view that? You know, as you're asking the question, it made me think of the line, you know, sometimes people will say, the devil made me do it. And that really is not a good line because the devil can propose that we do something, but he cannot impose. We always have free will. And ultimately, the devil would want us to unite our free will with his. Because really, from a faith perspective, you know, what's the one thing that God does not have that God desires from us? It's our free will to unite our free will with God and then to live our lives in a manner pleasing to God. The devil would want us to use our free will to turn away from God and then to be involved in evil. You know, the story of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis, the serpent didn't take the forbidden fruit and cram it down Eve's throat. He had to present it to her as something good, and so she chose it. So that's the challenge in life is when we see horrific things uh, in humanity, you know, you mentioned, you know, serial killers. Oftentimes people will ask about Hitler, you know, was he possessed? And again, we can't say that the devil is, you know, the root cause of all of these things. He might be moving in the shadows, but ultimately we do have free will. And we have to recognize that, you know, we have responsibility for the actions that we make. We can't simply say, well, it was the devil and it wasn't me. Because again, the devil can propose that we do something, but he cannot impose it on us. Mm-hmm. So, well, okay. So that kind of begs a legal question. Um, and what the church's view would be on this. I mean, I know what the law's view is on it, but you know, you, you can be found, uh, you know, you commit a crime, right. You can be found. Um, uh, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting the legal terminology, but, uh, guilty, mentally. but by reason of insanity or yeah, by something. reason of an insanity or, or, or whatnot, you know, are there, it sounds like you don't really view it that way. I mean, um, well, if somebody can be insane, sure, right? They, they can be suffering from a schizophrenic breakdown. That That's certainly possible. But the church would not say, well, they were possessed by a demon. They, 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 they have to be held less accountable for that crime because we've assessed that they're possessed by a demon. That's not, that's not, it sounds like that's not what you would suggest because in the end, they're operating off of some sense of free will. Or are there certain possessions where they, they they're, that free will is, do you assess that it is taken away? Yeah, free will can be compromised because ultimately I think every choice that a person makes, and even St. Thomas Aquinas would allude to this, that we only make choices that we perceive to be good. So even when Lucifer chose to rebel against God, he perceived that rebellion to be a good. Hmm. Now his understanding was distorted 
but you know, I think we only make choices in life that we perceive to be good. But then again, the question would be, is there a distortion in our way of thinking? But ultimately people only choose that which they believe to be a good. I mean, I think we see that in society today with a lot of the choices that people make and perhaps the polarization that we see in society. People yeah. only make choices that they perceive to be good, but we have to understand that maybe our line of thinking is distorted and it has to be brought back into a proper way of thinking. And from a Christian perspective, we would say that God is that authority, if you will, that gives us the proper way to look at and think about things. But again, the devil would be the one that's trying to distort all of that. The devil may not be the cause of all of our problems, but I would say the devil is an opportunist, meaning if there is some type of fracture or brokenness in society, the devil could insert himself into that and try to take a bad situation and make it even worse. So you look at somebody that may be a serial killer, did they grow up in some type of dysfunction and brokenness that it wasn't dealt with in a healthy manner and it continued to spiral downwards? And then maybe there wasn't a demonic connection that was made that he took that brokenness to even a higher level that someone then makes choices that we look at that and say, that's just completely inhumane. Because there, again, as you pointed out, there's a distinction between somebody that just kind of steps out of line briefly and does something wrong, but they understand the wrongness of their action and they repent. And someone who steps out of line and then continues to just move in a complete opposite direction. Right. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, there's, there's certainly a distinction. And I guess we don't have a great explanation for to this day. I mean, medically or spiritually on, on, on how, how that happens or, or why exactly it happens. Um, there's also an interesting discussion about, you know, the nature of the devil. I think, I think some would say, well, when we say the devil, we mean evil generally, you know, and, um, but that's not, not really what the, the church, prescribes that there is a devil i mean just as is yep. there a god and um you know as, as best as we can understand it with our, our our feeble human minds it manifests as sort of this personification of a of a entity um just as demons are actual entities moving amongst us um how is there another way to describe that is there um is it in layman's terms, I suppose, right? Like, is it, is it, is it, um, <clears throat> I don't even know how, I don't even know, not, not even sure what I'm asking here, I guess it's, is if they're, if they're specific entities, how can they be everywhere at once? Do they have that omnipresence the way God does? Are they, you know, but, the, but of course they're not as powerful as, as the power mm -hmm. of God, but, and yet they're, and yet they still have that sort of omniscience, that that omnipresence throughout. How does how, how does the church describe that? So the church would say that obviously God is the creator of all things. If you look at the first 10 words in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what does that tell us? In the beginning, God created time. God created the heavens. God created space. God created the earth. God created matter. So God is beyond time, space, and matter as we understand it. So God is the only one that we can call supernatural. He's above nature and beyond it. And then for demons, spiritual creatures, we would say that they have intellect and will. You know, the church would say that when angelic creatures were created, like a computer that's been downloaded with information, they don't have to learn anything. That's why a demon can speak a language that, you know, that person didn't know. The demon doesn't have to go to school and learn how to speak Greek. It can just call it up immediately. And so, again, there is that sense of the angelic nature. But we would say that angelic creatures, good and fallen, are preternatural. They're kind of above our understanding of the natural world. So God created spiritual creatures. God created bodily creatures. Think of the animals. But then the human person is both spiritual and body in form and then demons what would they want us to do again they would want us to unite our will with theirs in their rejection of god so that we don't live the way that god calls us to live 
we kind of like act animal in nature. So you think of demons, when they manifest, they're always growling and snarling, kind of behavior that we would see within animals. Mm. And I think demons do that. They're trying to distort the human image. The human person is created in the image and likeness of God. And then the demons who want to distort the goodness of the human person, believing that when they do that indirectly, they're uh, attacking God himself. When it comes to demonic possession, we could even ask the question, why would a demon be interested in possessing the human body? And the reason for that would be at the very core of Christian belief, namely the greatest thing that God did for us was the incarnation. God took on human form in the mm -hmm. person of Jesus. And because the demons especially the devil, would want to mimic God in every possible way. The devil believes that he has his own version of the incarnation, taking on human form by possessing a human body. How do you, how do you explain <laughs> um, what you described earlier is, a, you know, I think a movement away from, from Christianity. Um, what do you think is behind that? Is it d d definitely different um, schools of thought here? Uh, some churches, not the Catholic church, but, but other denominations might say like, we, we've got to be more open to the sort of the, the, the whims of society, right? As society changes, we have to change with it. And mm -hmm. sometimes that means bringing like rock bands into a congregation. Uh, sometimes, you know, it just, it's just like adding some flair to the, mm -hmm. uh, to, to the worship session. Um, sometimes it means changing doctrine entirely. Um, and then others would say, like the, the the real problem is 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 it's the opposite problem, right? It's it's the it's the allowance of change in the church that is that has given people the 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 belief that it, it, it really isn't that rock solid of a foundation, and it's it's um it's not really a place one can go, and so that's that's one can go for for true uh, moral structure. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's led to a, a, a movement away from it. Um, may, may, maybe both ideas are, are true to some extent, right? Because some people do want like an easier church, let's call it, like an easier moral framework to deal with. Um, and then some people are looking for a little bit more structure. And either, either way, like you said, there's a decline in attendance. I'm not sure that's a, I have seen other data that would indicate that there's, that doesn't mean necessarily a decline in spirituality just a decline in sort of physical um, attendance of, of a church, whether it's Catholic or otherwise. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what are your observations? What do you think is, is, is the trends going on? I think one of the, the questions might be, I think people have this strong sense for something spiritual in their lives. And maybe they sense that Christianity no longer fulfills that. So they're beginning to look elsewhere. And I would suggest that perhaps these people never fully grasp or understood the true components of what it means to be a Christian. Because I think the way the church delivers the Christian message, certainly the delivery can change, but the core message itself cannot because it comes from God. So there is something we would say that is objective truth. There is truth that comes from God that is never changing. Now how we articulate that truth Perhaps there's different ways that we can do that. You know, I remember um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to listen to a Catholic bishop, uh, Bishop David O'Donnell, out in Los Angeles. He was murdered earlier this year, in fact. But he was from, he was from Ireland, and he spoke about, you know, the tragedy of the Catholic Church in Ireland was that when the clergy sex abuse scandal hit Ireland, he, and these are his words, the people knew the rules and regulations of the Catholic Church, but perhaps they didn't know the person of Jesus Christ. So when the scandal hit, they abandoned the church, but they didn't know Christ well enough to go to Christ. And so I think when I look at Christianity in the world today, maybe we think of it in terms as an institution rather than a relationship. And ultimately, that's what we need. We need a relationship with Christ. But that relationship needs to be both personal, but also communal. Because people might say, well, I'm spiritual, but I don't need to go to any particular church. But they fail to recognize the important role 
that other people play in our lives because the human person, we're social. We're meant yeah. to be in a community and connected with one another. You know, if you want to punish somebody, what do you do? You know, go to your room. You put them in solitary confinement. Yeah. But the human person needs to be engaged with other human persons to properly grow and develop. And I think that's, you know, the word church itself comes from the Greek word ecclesia, meaning community. So the human person needs to be in community. And then I would say that we also have to make sure that those communities are good and healthy communities and not ones that are just brought together perhaps by the commonality of evil. So that would be a distorted sense of community. So I think the challenge for Christianity today would be how does the church go out to the people? Because if we're waiting for people to come to us, maybe they're not going to do so. It's one of the reasons why even being public in the ministry of exorcism, people are like, why would you do that? I mean, I have a lot of people that ridicule me. I get all kinds of crazy messages and whatnot. But I believe that the good that comes from being public outweighs the ugliness that I see that people may direct towards me. I've got emails from people that maybe have listened to an interview and it challenged them to really think about their faith, maybe the role that God should play in their lives. They reconnected with their church. You know, as a Catholic priest, I'm not trying to proselytize other people, but it's about getting people connected with God in their life, letting people realize that that relationship with God can truly make a big difference in helping people deal with any type of brokenness or woundedness that they may be experiencing. I get emails from people all over the world. I got one from a lady recently in Australia that said that she listened to a, an interview that I did and it motivated her to go and reconnect with her faith. Other people have decided to become Catholic. They receive instructions. They've been brought into the church. So really it's the way of evangelizing, if you will. Because basically, I, by being public, I'm trying to say to people, is there room for God in your life? And if there is room for God, then God ultimately is the one who can help put the pieces of your life back together and give the human person ultimate meaning, purpose, and direction in their life. St. Augustine, who lived at the end of the 4th and early 5th centuries, the great classic line where he said, uh, Oh God, you have created us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. I believe that the human person has the innate desire for God. And only when we fulfill that innate desire for God, will we come to truly discover what it means to truly be fully human and alive. Are, are you seeing, um, I'm a child of the nineties. Okay. And so it did, it did seem to me that the obsession with the occult was kind of at a height at that point in time. Um, <laughs> it just from music and movies and, and just kind of pop culture and the goth and all that. Um, it, but are, are you seeing a, are, are you seeing an increase in, in that kind of usage or, or a decrease? What are kids doing? What are kids up to these days? Right, because they're actually they're having less sex and less alcohol and less drugs in in, in your in your and well I don't know about less drugs but the <laughs> in your in your high school, um, you know just but just by the data that we have, um, so some would say that's a good thing, uh, others would say it's a bad thing because it's probably an ind indication that they're having all their social interaction on social media as opposed to in person, yeah. um, but where do you see society going from from your perspective as 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 far as this next generation? I, yeah, that's the, uh, you know, you mentioned maybe social media and technology. I think the danger with some of that is that we see our young people living in isolation, that they're growing up in front of a screen rather than having true authentic uh, relationships and friendships with one another. So that sense of community is being lost. And I think the loss of the sense of community is why perhaps people don't see the value of church. And I, you know, there's so many people in isolation today. And because of that isolation, I think we see a lot of young people that are discouraged or depressed. I think that's why we see a, a growing trend, perhaps, of young people that are having an identity crisis of who they are. Maybe they no longer want to live. We see a growing trend towards suicide. 
So I think with a lot of young people today, I think a common theme would be that there is an identity crisis in, in who they are and what it means to truly be alive. So yeah, if you yeah. look at the turn of the last millennium, there was a big focus, I think, on new age and and all of that. But I think today, people have delved so much deeper into this world of technology and information. And yet, with all of this information at our fingertips, I think that the human person is still tr- struggling to to try to define who we are. Yeah. And again, I, yeah. I think we see that woundedness in a lot of young people. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. It's, by the way, it's also what I hear from our school systems, from our law enforcement, that they they're seeing an uptick in in mental health crisis like they've never seen before, and especially manifesting in younger kids, which is interesting because it demonstrates that it's not necessarily social media. I mean, this is this is this is pre this is prior to their being on social media, and then and then you know as they get older, they're they're, they're certainly more isolated than they were. The, the obsession with the occult, I, you know, I, I, I do think it was a, definitely a product of the 90s, again, just growing up in that era. But also then, but then again, like you see everybody who was, you know, dressed up that way and doing those things, whatever those things were, um, you know, a few years, few years later, dressing normally and having kids. So uh, it was it appears to be a fad in, in most cases. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there there's certainly a a a crisis of of yeah maybe it's loneliness maybe it's just uh, restlessness it's the, lostness it's the, right it's now the need, it's the need to want to be noticed i had a young yeah. man who came to see me and this is years ago and it was caught up in the goth and you know the all the dark clothing and the mm-hmm. hair covering his face and all of that and his mother asked if he would talk to me he was 14 years old and so he came in and he didn't really want to talk at first but he finally kind of opened up. And when I said to him, do you ever feel like that maybe in school that nobody ever notices you and you do all this as a way to be noticed? It's a cry for help. He literally began to sob uncontrollably because it touched on the fact that he just didn't really have any connection with anybody. And because of that, he was basically saying, will somebody please take notice and see that I'm here? And so all the, whether it's the goth or all the, the things that young people do, I think it's it's really saying, please take notice that I'm here. Right. And I think that's really when I think of church, I think that's the role of the church is to say to people, yeah, you do matter. And I think a lot of people look at the church today and think of it as a series of rules and regulations and that somehow if you step out of line, then you're a bad person. But, you know, I think the role of the church, even a, uh, Pope John the 23rd back in the early 1960s said that the church needs to be a mother and a teacher. As a teacher, the church will always uphold the truth of the gospel that comes to us from God. But how we deliver that truth maybe needs to change with a motherly voice to let people know that, you know, the mother is always going to love you. You know, I will say to a parent sometime, is there anything your child could do that would make you stop loving them? And the answer is absolutely not. You may be disappointed in a choice that they make, but you can never be disappointed in who they are, namely your child. And I think when that's the view of God that perhaps we need to have that, yeah, there are some times that we sin, but God is that loving parent who's always ready to forgive with that unconditional love. The, 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 the critics of the church, whether it's the Catholic church or otherwise, but it's usually the Catholic church because it's been around the longest. And and it has a, a, quite a history to it. And <clears throat> people who, and look, there's, 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 there's always, especially with young people, there's always just this rebellion against tradition, whatever that tradition is. And w- whether it's a spiritual tradition or whether it's an economic tradition, right? It's like, you know, you're young and you're like, I, I know better. You know, I just, it, it's, 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 it's just kind of romantic idealism of, kind of revolution oftentimes. And so I think that's, I think that's the deeper psychological underpinnings of, of, of why we see young people rebelling against whatever they're rebelling against. And so my job as a, you know, a political conservative is to say, hold on a second, stop and think there's a reason things are the way they are. It doesn't mean they can't change. It's just, you know, there's, there's consequences to, to rapid change. Um, But they'll, they'll, again, whether it's, <clears throat> whether it's uh, an economic discussion or a spiritual discussion, what they'll do is they'll attach 
their argument to you know a specific wrongdoing of the church, whether it's like the Spanish Inquisition. I thought that the Pope's Exorcist movie uh, uh, had a very clever explanation for the Inquisition. It was all a possession. <laughs> well, it wasn't us. Nothing to see here. Um, of course, that's not true, right? It was it was bad people doing the wrong thing. You know that that uh, out outside the the will of God. In my opinion, that's that's my opinion of say. I think what what's happened there, and I think. You know, how do you respond to those criticisms? Um, I, my my response is is generally look like you're 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 not criticizing God in this case. You're criticizing men who veered from God, and yes. that was wrong. I, and and to the extent that it's 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 maybe maybe the maybe the best criticism of the Catholic Church is 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 not wholly embracing that that wrong, right? It, it, yes. As 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 um, said, Bishop O'Donnell had kind of alluded to. Yeah, I think that might be the case. Yeah. You know, I think you're right. There's always a clear distinction between um, the core beliefs of the church that come from God and then maybe the sins of those who are in the church. You know, obviously the big thing issue that people would look at would be clergy sex abuse. That's we've seen that in so prevalent in the last couple of decades. You know, the church can't hide behind any of that. I think the church would have to own it because, you know, the church doesn't have a monopoly on uh, the abuse of children. Certainly we need to acknowledge our own sinfulness, but the way that the church would choose to respond to its own sins could be a way for society in general to help address the issue of the abuse of children that we see, unfortunately, across the board in so many different aspects of human life. But if, you know, the church, if it truly is going to be an institution of God, has to acknowledge its own sinfulness. And then in doing so, perhaps help to chart a course forward to deal with abuse in general that we see in our society. But I think when the church runs away from its own sinfulness is when the church puts itself up against even greater ridicule. And then people say, well, the church is just another human institution what's really divine or godly about it if it can't acknowledge its own mistakes, whether it's clergy sex abuse, whether it's the Inquisition, or any other th- aspect that we can look back in history. Yeah. And and, and I guess helping people remind me, I, I, I thought what you what you said about, it was a Bishop O'Donnell. Yeah. Um, I, I think that quote is, it, it's a meaningful one, right? It, it um, you know, failing t- teaching people the the traditions and the rights, but not the actual um, sense of connection uh, yeah. w- w- with with God and, and this sense of absolute truth. I, I bring this up a lot in, in political discussions because you have to do, you have to help people understand where our laws come from and you know why they're just. And how did you even how, how did you even come to the conclusion that what we're doing is just how do you know what justice is how do you know what right and wrong is like how do you know right mm-hmm. and and so the atheists would say oh we just kind of know we're just going to figure it out um and well it's like no you have to know like there has to be some kind of authority and there has to be a backstop at a certain point and you know the first backstop is as, as best as we know is the 10 commandments and right that's why there's the, the picture of moses or it's a portrait relief of moses right in the house of representatives it looks down at the speaker of the house there's there's 23 other lawgivers you know historical lawgivers that have that have influenced our sense of law and what is right and wrong but that's the first because it's true and it can't be argued with and mm-hmm. that, that's so it's such an important base to operate from and um it's, it's, it's important to remind people that w- whether you, whether you believe in God or not, there's we are a Christian tradition uh, society, right? We, our, our civilization was based off of that moral framework, and there's an anchor there that's that, that's quite important. You know, I, I I come to faith very philosophically. I I, I always have, um, and <sighs> because it's it's it's. It, they're, they're maybe by the sense of there, there can't be any other option. We had a really interesting podcast somewhat recently on, um, on, uh, uh, you know, evolution versus, um, intelligent design and, and this, this, this idea that we can be created from, from nothing without some kind of supernatural force, you know, it, it's literally, it's just impossible. It's just not possible. Um, and so, you know, I think helping people, 
understand that you got you got to meet people where they're at right if they're they, if they view themselves as a sort of a science i follow the science type of person um well okay let's let's go down that path let's let's use the scientific path and, and bring you to god that way i think that's that's certainly that's actually how i come to god um mm-hmm. personally and, and philosophically so um i I, I certainly, you know, whether whether the church is in decline or not, it certainly depends on where you're at. I, I, I and I'm not so sure. I see it around here. I, I see churches packed. Um, in Europe, it's an obvious decline. In the Northeast, it seems seems an, an obvious decline. It depends on what part of the country you're in. Uh, in Indiana, I, I I assume it's pretty healthy. I don't know. Um, it's, but but, but it is. But I'm, you, I'm the pa- I'm the pastor of two churches, St. Michael and St. Peter churches here in Brookville, Indiana. Yeah, I do five masses a weekend, two on Saturday, three on Sunday, and I would say that all the masses are are packed and pretty full. Again, I think people recognize the importance of having God in their life. You know, if Christianity is the anchor, the danger would be that if we just cut away that anchor, we're just going to find ourselves adrift. And I think for people who are rejecting Christianity, even if they grew up in a traditional Christian home, then they're finding themselves adrift. And when they're adrift, they may be latching onto all different kinds of things. You know, you're out in the ocean and you're, you know, you're adrift, you're going to grab onto anything that floats along, but everything that floats along isn't necessarily going to be good. And I would say that in my world of exorcism, a good analogy would be that sometimes when people are adrift because they've rejected Christianity, what they're latching on is, is to, is to evil, to the devil. And that's a connection that's only going to bring about greater harm and certainly not any good. Father, I think this has been a, a fascinating discussion. It's, it's, it's helped, I think, remove some of the taboo and the mystery around an, an, an exorcism. Um, I think there's definitely a perception out there that it's it's this, I don't even know what the, how to describe what the perception might be, like this, this sort of... Uh, special power you know imbued upon a yeah. priest so that it gives them a, a this this like special battleground versus satan and you know the way you describe it it's 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 prayer i mean it's yeah. it's literally just it, it's it's praying over someone um who is afflicted by something that can't be explained uh by by other medical science and yeah. um it's just that you know in the catholic tradition you, you, you tend to have a lot more structure around these things than other denominations do and so it does give there's there's benefit to that but i guess i suppose the the it also opens you up more to critiques um in in a sense and and i think it, it's it's absolutely helpful that that priests like you um do become more public and help us understand it so thank you for doing that yeah, my pleasure. Good to be with you today. Good to be with you as well. And uh, it's been enlightening and 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 uh, I think a great conversation. Thank you for doing this, Father. Yep, my pleasure.